All right. Well, Nancy, I say we go ahead and get this thing kicked off. It's about to flip over to 130 here. So um, my name is Brad Griffith. You've probably seen me on some other sessions throughout this event, and I will be serving as the moderator for this session. So if you have any questions along the way, you're, I think, welcome to unmute here, obviously, and engage with us. But feel free to also type those in the chat if that's your preferred method of communication. But without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Nancy Gwynn, who is a registered nurse as well. I always like to include that there from the University of Central Oklahoma. And she is actually the program director for the RN to BS online program and is going to talk about uh, standardizing academic templates and how that resonates or reconciles with academic freedom. Uh, Nancy and her team and our NWS program at UCO went through this process whenever they decided to convert their program to online. And I'm excited to hear, Nancy, what you have to say about this process uh, this, with specific regard to academic freedom, because that's <laughs> a concern that I've heard a lot of times uh, regarding templates, you know, and making things consistent, which I'm sure you're also going to tell us can greatly benefit your students at the end if you can do that. So, Nancy, I'll turn it over to you, and I'm here if you need anything at all. Thank you, Brad. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> all right, can, is my... Is, We're all set. Um, okay, all right, good. Thank you. And as Brad very graciously introduced, the topic uh, is about standardization in online programs and it's kind of versus academic freedom because uh, in some cases they seem at odds with each other. And I, the purpose of this uh, discussion is gonna be to share strategies based on my experience in developing the fully online RNBS program at UCO and kind of strategies that we utilized. And uh, I love the topic of this is lessons learned because that's basically where we're going with that is, is we were very fortunate in that a lot of stuff that we did early on uh, helped address this issue. So let me just start by saying standardization and online learning is not a new concept. There's plenty of literature, there's plenty of research out there that talks about the advantages to the students for this. Um, it's pretty overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly positive thing for students. Um, on, and on the other hand, academic freedom is not a new concept either. I mean, it's been around for hundreds of years and there's plenty of literature out there about it as well. What's interesting is there is very, liter very little literature or research on how to balance these two concepts. How do we make it uh, standardized enough that students benefit and faculty too without taking away the concept of academic freedom for faculty? So as we get started, <clears throat> I think it's important to talk, make sure that we all know what the terms are that we're using. So when I speak about standardization, basically it's very simple. It's similarity in the course design and course processes within an online program. So if you think about standardization being on a spectrum from one end being, you know, maybe you know, maybe the fonts are all the same or, or you know, just, just something very minor being consistent to all the way on the spectrum to just about everything except the specific course content being the same. The online RN to BS program at UCO is at this end of the spectrum. We have almost everything consistent and standardized except the actual course content. And um, while we have the same number of discussion boards, we have the same number of um, scholarly papers, we have uh, the same grading rubric, we have the same due dates, but the content within those courses obviously are, are gonna be different because they're different courses. That just kind of gives you an idea of where we are. And so when I talk about how we got there, you know that we, we are on that end of the spectrum. Um, 
All right. So I, I'm sure I, I, I'm not sure who all you are that are here, but I imagine there's a lot of instructional designers. There's a lot of faculty in here. And I just want to kind of just briefly talk about the advantages of standardization. And there are advantages to both students and faculty. Students, obviously, it is easier to navigate. And the less time they spend trying to figure out where stuff is, the more time they have to actually be participating in the classwork. Also, if you can standardize any kind of uh, consistent expectations, <clears throat> and let me give you kind of a, an example of that that we did. Um, we decided to see if we could come up with uh, two grading rubrics, one for discussion boards and one for scholarly papers to see if it would work across all courses. And, uh, and we did. And what we have found is that as students progress through the program, their writing gets significantly better. Their, their, you know, all of their coursework gets better because they've received feedback already on the grades that they got in their initial courses. And so, uh, you know, the, the consistent expectations, they know what to expect from every paper they write, it's the same. So that's just one example uh, of that. Advantages of standardization for faculty is consistency in messaging is one. And I'll give you an example of that. When we started the program, so a lot of it, as you can tell, is, is writing assignments. And nursing is, it adopts the APA format. And what we were finding was, for example, I was very uh, fixated, you could say, on like it has to be double spaced and this is how you do citations. Whereas the next faculty member was spending a lot of time talking about, you know, how do you cite uh, you know, two citations within one paragraph. And so students were just being overwhelmed and saying, but this teacher told me this and this teacher told me this and she didn't say anything about this. And so what the faculty again decided to do was to standardize um, how we were gonna approach APA formatting. So we sat down and we made a list of the important things. And those of you that know about APA formatting know that that book is impossible for students to memorize. And so we identified <clears throat> a list on one page of all the things that we expected students to do and that, that we thought were the most important things. Like they're not doctoral level students, they're bachelor's level students. And what did we expect from that level of student regarding APA? And so the faculty decided we were all going to give feedback on those items and right. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can you guys see the chats. So when I comment to them, do you can you see those too? Anyway, we can. Yeah. OK, <laughs> I didn't want you to think I was just talking to myself. Um, and, and, and it was helpful to the faculty because now I know what to talk about. And I know that if I'm teaching the second course, they've already been told these certain things. So a lot of this consistency and standardization, not just in the course design, but those are the kinds of things I'm talking about when I talk about course processes. Um, it ensures that the curriculum is covered. If I know that when we design these courses, a faculty member is not going to come in here and just, you know, randomly change things. So for me, when it is our accreditation time and the accreditors are asking me, how do we measure this standard? I know exactly where it is. I know exactly where it is across the program. And so uh, we can ensure that the curriculum is covered in the manner that, that it had originally been designed. It also makes it enormously easier for new faculty and adjuncts, adjuncts to come on board. If y'all have ever adjunct in an online program and just kind of were thrown in and you're left wondering, I don't know how anybody else interprets this and have they gotten feedback on this already? Am I the first person to tell them this? And it can be very, it can be very overwhelming. And so having standardization, and we'll get to faculty guidelines here in a little bit, makes it incredibly easy for people to come on board. Now, when I sat and I thought, okay, to be fair, I have to talk about disadvantages because, you know, I should. 
Uh, I had a hard time coming up with a disadvantage for students. And the one that I that I did think about was, and when I think about our program, you know, doing a bunch of discussion boards and papers can be rather monotonous. Now, our program is only two semesters, so they really don't have enough time to, to feel like it's boring. Um, so we have an advantage that way. We haven't received any student comments, negative comments, uh, indicating that it might be. But if you were in, you know, all four programs or maybe three years, um, you, you might think about standardizing it in a way that's that has some, some variation. And then we come to a disadvantage of standardization for faculty. And probably the number one reason that I hear uh, that, that faculty do not appreciate the standardization of courses has to do with academic freedom. So how many of you, if you'll jump on the chat there, how many of you have heard or felt pushback from faculty uh, to the concept of standardizing online courses based on issues of academic freedom? Yep. All right. Yes. Okay. Several people have. Somebody hasn't. Good for you. Um, you have a highly evolved uh, faculty, I'm just going to say. Big issue. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so yeah, we're all on the page about this is a this is a thing. This is a thing. Okay, well, let's talk about what academic freedom is. Let's all be very clear about what we're talking about. So Miriam Webster defines academic freedom as the freedom to teach or to learn without interference, censorship, or retaliation. Okay. It is a great concept. It goes back hundreds of years for very good reasons. If you look up the history of academic freedom, it really is quite fascinating. Um, there's a really great article in a 2010 um, publication of Inside Higher Ed by Nelson, who had a whole list kind of expanded out the definition of academic freedom. And I found one in particular that, that kind of has to do with what we are talking about. And the definition that he gave was that it gives faculty members substantial latitude in deciding how to teach courses for which they are responsible. Okay, so this is where we're going to get into the, the how are we teaching it aspect. <clears throat> um, so now that we kind of understand what standardization is, the advantages, what academic freedom is, it's clear what the advantages of that are. Let's talk about the steps that we took um, to maintain the balance and to honor the positive aspects of both standardization and academic freedom for faculty. So step number one, um, and, and before we, we, we get into this, let me tell you that we had a face-to-face RN to BS program that we had had for, gosh, almost 20 years, all right? And we decided, thank you, Brad, we decided to, based on student demand, we were going to scrap it and we were going online. And so anybody that is making the evolution to fully online program that's getting some resistance can probably take some cues from, from what we did. So step number one is to gather the online team and do not underestimate the power of this because if you are unable to accomplish this part, you're going to struggle in uh, trying to standardize your program. Have a clear vision of what it looks like and be able to articulate it. Um, the next thing is based on that vision, identify the supporters and the non-supporters. And usually that is not a difficult thing to do. 
Um, Non-supporters are gonna be those people that uh, you've heard them talk about online is easier, online is not as good, online, uh, students don't learn as much online, I hate online. <laughs> you guys have all heard these comments, I'm assuming, because I've heard them like a lot. Um, what we found for the online supporters, and I did do a research project a few months ago, <laughs> I love that, Melissa. Yes, they are wrong. I did a research project uh, uh, a few months ago that surveyed nurse faculty throughout the country and looked at uh, acceptance and concerns. And then I tried to correlate them with various demographic information. And the only correlation I found was that faculty that had been an online student in an online program were more accepting of, of being and teaching in an online program. So if you have faculty that have gone through an online program as a student, snatch them up because they are gonna be some of your best champions, I think. The next, the next uh, most frequent correlation was that they had taught online in an online program. Okay, so here's the other key, make it very okay not to participate. I probably said, and people teased me because I said this so often, but I walked around for about six months saying, online teaching is not everybody's jam. It's not. Most faculty that I work with were not hired, all faculty were not hired to teach online. They were hired to teach face-to-face. -face. They have an enormous amount of experience in face-to-face -face teaching. It's not their thing. That's okay. That's okay. But I also am famous for saying the train is moving. This online program train is moving. You can either jump on the train or get out of the way because I don't want you to be run over. So don't try to obstruct it or stop the train. Can't be done. We're coming, you know, just just if if you're not a supporter and don't love online learning, that's OK. That's OK. Do your thing. Do your thing. All right. So that's kind of my plea to that. Step number two was to start with the design. And when I talk to people about academic freedom, I say it's so much easier if you can separate course design from course content. Okay, course design does not feel as threatening to the majority of faculty. Like, like they tend to be okay if you tell me I, I, I gotta put it in this order, I'm okay as long as I can put what I want in there, okay? The course content part of it is much more trickier, much more trickier, um, any English majors out there? Um, and, and so separate those, be very clear about you are going to be identifying the design standardization first. Once you get past that, it becomes way easier to then standardize in the content. And we'll get to that. So separate those, start with the design. Use instructional designers. I can't say that enough. And I know there's a bunch of you on here and I love you all. But these people understand, you know, the data and the, the scientific reasons of why stuff works and why it doesn't. And it just helps faculty and presenting it as this is what the literature supports. This, these are, there are reasons that this is designed this way. Um, talking about accessibility issues and all of that. So partner up with your instructional designers and start with something very basic like the course template. Can we all decide or, or, you know, agree on um, that, you know, we're going to have a module for every week. I mean, these are, these are not threatening things. These are just structure issues and they tend to go pretty good. One of the things that we did at the very beginning was right up front, we all made an agreement. The team that I had assembled made an agreement that we were going to, uh, um, make team decisions based on consent, not consensus. So consent is that everybody may not agree, but we all agree to abide by it once the decision is made. Consensus means 
everybody is in love with it and agrees with it. And with, you know, we started out with 10 people. That's very difficult. That's a very high standard and it will bog your process down. So there were lots of times where we had lots of discussion, lots of debate, and we just voted. And whatever the vote was, everybody then got on board with it. Um, And we were lucky that we had a group that we were able to do that. Also, the orientation module in a course is a very non-threatening thing. Um, You know, the syllabus needs to go in there. How to contact faculty has to go in there. Uh, Netiquette issues need to go in there. And so that's really easy to standardize. And when students have that in every one of their classes, number one, they know where it is. And number two, it just reinforces that information and that content. Step number three is to treat the program like a book. Um, and so if you're, if the book is the online program from start to finish and each of your courses are the chapters in that book, then, you know, I say, nobody wants to read a book that every chapter is in a different language, you know, or it looks completely different. You want it to flow. You want it to make sense. You want it to build on each other. And so that requires some sort of an editor job. And for us, the team, we had by this time narrowed it down to four members of our teaching team, and we all acted as the editor. We looked through everybody's course and came to those decisions together. Step number four is where you're starting to get in. You're still not in content, but you're now into faculty guidelines type of of issues. And start with those things again that are not as threatening. So how are we going to orient Um, faculty that come on board. And so you'll start coming up with with strategies and issues and requirements. And it's really interesting what happens because then, you know, they can't hardly uh, require new people to do something without doing them themselves. So, you know, so it was kind of a a double whammy that, that we were able to do when we just looked at orientation, then look at processes to make changes. We had an adjunct who had a great idea and we build into our thing. You cannot change your, you cannot change the structure of your course unless you go through the process. And the process is you just submit it to this, to the faculty team, they review it. And what has happened is every suggestion people have loved and we have made the change through the whole program, every single one of them. So it's a, I love the fact that that's how that happened. I mean, we never didn't make the change. We made it bigger than what, what we would have if we just let faculty make their own changes. We also have very frequent faculty meetings. And I know everybody rolls, rolls their eyes and thinks that that's the worst torture that, that you can imagine. Uh, we have them every other week for one hour, but they are working meetings. We make decisions. We, you know, we measure things. We collect data. Um, and nobody yet has told me that that they're not happy we're doing those. We can also make decisions quickly. So um, if we want to standardize a change throughout the program, we can do it for the next eight week block of courses. We don't have to wait a year um, to make those make those changes. Here's where you start getting into some touchy areas. Turnaround times for things like emails. It can, you know, can we all agree that you can, that you have to answer an email within 24 hours? And if the answer is yes, and most of us do it within, you know, that day, um, but set a time frame on it. And so you can communicate to the students so that they know when they can expect an answer on their email and they're not freaking out. Um, and it also keeps them from waiting till the last minute if they, if they need an answer to something. And then turnaround times on providing feedback. And those two items right there, turnaround times to emails and, and, and posting grades are the t- number, are the two most uh, common issues that will impact your student satisfaction in online programs. Um, so, t- so standardize it, tell your students what they can expect. And the last uh, step is to measure your success. And here's, here's a Nancyism. And I've said this again a hundred times. I really repeat myself a lot, but there is no better way to quiet the naysayers than to be successful. 
Um, so you can have them in your ear talking about how online is terrible, but you have to measure success and you have to talk about success. So the two things that are super easy to measure, student satisfaction, make sure you ask a question about the standardization of design and the standardization of processes. Use that data. Students will love it. And then talk about how much they love it as much as you can. And then attrition rates are another, another good indicator that um, you know, student satisfaction and attrition rates go together. And so just continually be talking about the measures of success that you that you have. Oh, I feel like I talked really fast there at the end, but uh, that's kind of how we did it. And Brad, can we take like five minutes just to see if anybody has any questions or want to share anything? Uh, we have questions, but for sure, okay. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to steal the show and start with one of my own here, Nancy. Yes. I'm really curious about, you know, I obviously know that the faculty in your program, you are in touch with them on a very regular basis. And I'm sure that feedback loop is pretty close, you know, with them. But with the student satisfaction surveys, how often do you all look at that information, the data that you're receiving? And how often do you try to make changes to the template based upon their feedback? Excellent question. When we started the first year, so we our first year was the, the fall of 2019. During that year, we made, and all of our courses are eight week blocks. We did satisfactions at week four and at the end of every course for that first year. So we collected a lot of data and we made changes like within a week on a lot of that stuff. And we notified the students that it was based on their, on their input from the surveys to keep them doing the surveys. Uh, it's gotten it's gotten farther apart because now we kind of know and we've we've kind of gotten enough data that we know uh, this is working for them. But we uh, survey them at the end of every semester. Okay. And, and then we have a very large one at the end of the program okay. survey. Yeah. There's a question in the chat here from Jared that I'm going to expand just a little bit upon what he asked here. So his basic question is, how long did it take you to implement this? And I wonder, Nancy, if in your answer, you might talk about the timeline from your program deciding that it was going to go online to those initial meetings I know that you all had together with the instructional designers for the template. And then again, what that looked like rolling it out to the individual courses that had to be designed after that, because it's kind of a domino effect process that seemed like it happened there. Absolutely. Um, from the moment that we decided, we stopped admissions into the face-to-face -face and decided we wanted to go fully online, we had a year where we, you know, we did, you know, we got faculty together, we got ideas. Um, there were a lot of us that had been online students and we sat down. One of the first things we did was, you know, make a list of do's and don'ts based on student aspect, what worked for us as students. And then we started saying, we got to incorporate this into our program. So then we would go to the instructional designer and said, this is what we want to look like. And, and everybody said what they loved was the standardization, you know, um, but we didn't standardize everything at the beginning. That came based on student uh, feedback after we went live. So we still to this day are making tweaks and changes I'm trying to think of what the very late, latest thing was. Oh, we surveyed and students told us they, they didn't see, they weren't using the textbook. They didn't see the need. Why were we requiring a textbook? Wow. So we thought about that and we thought, you know, we have to tie our discussion questions more into what they're reading in the textbook to, to show them that, that, you know, that we're looking for that. Let's talk about that. And so we made uh, changes to the requirements on our discussion questions. And we did that just like a month ago. Um, and we'll survey them at the end of the semester on, on that change. Mm -hmm. um, so did I answer the question? I, uh, I think that was perfect, Nancy. And we have time for one more here that I'm going to grab in the chat. Uh, and I think, Jareth, your next question here that popped in probably ties a bit to Hossein's, but how do you balance this notion of standardization and innovation? Uh, for example, if faculty has met the standards and want to go beyond that, you know, with adding their own elements in the course, personalizations, uh, you know, additional things, do you stop them from doing so until the next round of review, uh, you know, with that opportunity to discuss? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, it sounds terrible, but... 
like, um, I wonder if who, who wrote that, Jared, if you could give oh, me same. an example, um, like if you want to do like we had a faculty that that wanted to do Flipgrid videos as the last discussion. OK, that was me um, as the last discussion. Let's have them do Flipgrids. I didn't do it in my course. I went to the faculty meeting. We talked about it. Everybody loved the idea. We decided to do it across the board and we implemented it in the next eight week block. Um, so we do not, everybody really truly believes in the standardization and the, and the benefit of that. So we really don't have people out there wanting to do stuff on their own. Um, now, if they want to, you know, like update instructions on a particular paper that has to do with content, we're not nearly, we're not nearly so standardized on that. Content is content. You're the expert. You teach it how you need to teach it. It's more about the structure um, and you know, uh, kind of kind of from the student perspective, like we don't want them having to learn new technology and new media, you know, every class. Um, yeah, so I hope that, that was a great question and I hope yeah, that. That was great. Yeah, and uh, I'm just gonna touch last on this uh, other question again from Jarrett to fully answer. And Nancy, I know from working with you, you are enrolled as an instructor and, and able to observe these adjunct taught sections for the yeah. consistency there as program coordinator, uh, which is part of her role, you know, designated as uh, in that role, program coordinator. So uh, I really hate to cut this one off. I could probably Ooh. visit with you another 20 minutes about this, Nancy, but we have another session that is starting. So uh, Nancy, is it okay if our audience members reach out to you if they have any questions Please. or want to follow up? I'll Absolutely. Email I would love to talk here. to anybody about how we did that and kind of the pitfalls and, and how we kind of uh, worked around those. Yeah, I love it. So um, do they have my email address? I just typed it in the chat there. It's in Gwyn, G-W-I-N at U-C-O dot E-D-U. And Nancy, thank you again so much for this awesome information here. Really appreciate yeah. it. All right. Enjoy everybody. Teach you all later. Take care. <laughs> and Nancy, you'll actually hit the end button on this session down there below. Oh, gotcha.